Welcome to Raw Online. So today we'll see on rapid sequence intubation and delayed sequence intubation. Rapid sequence intubation is a technique of achieving a definitive airway, the endotracheal tube, by simultaneous administration of an ingestion agent followed by a neuromuscular blocking agent so that immediate unconsciousness and paralysis is achieved in a patient to facilitate tracheal intubation. It is the fastest and preferred method in case of emergency intubation. The indications for rapid sequence intubation are the dynamically deteriorating clinical condition where there is real need for speed and respiratory and ventilatory compromise, extremely short safe apnea times and sometimes the full stomach where there is an increased risk of regurgitation, vomiting and aspiration. There could be secretions, blood and vomitus. What are the steps of rapid sequence intubation? First, before doing a procedure, make sure that we have a good IV access. Then connect the patient to a proper cardiac monitor where you'll be able to see if at all the patient has arrhythmias. Then an oximetry, get ready with your capnography or capnometry also. Plan the procedure along with the assessment of the physiological status and the airway difficulty. So this can be made by the mnemonic called as lemon. Okay. So this is the lemon way of airway assessment method. L stands for look externally. Before intubating, it's a practice that we ambu the patient, right? So the bagan mask should be kept over the face of the patient. If there is facial trauma, beard, mustache, then this bagan mask cannot be properly placed. Or in case there is a large incisor teeth or a large tongue, then your scope cannot be passed properly. Then E stands for to evaluate the 3-3-2 rule, which we see in detail. M stands for Malampati score and O stands for obstruction. That is, presence of any type of obstruction in the oral cavity like epiglottitis, peritonsular abscess or direct trauma in the oral cavity. And N stands for neck mobility, where only limited neck mobility is possible, uh, like in C-spine injury or some trauma where you cannot do a proper head tilt method. So these are the areas where you can anticipate a difficult airway. So what is this? Evaluate 332 rule. So this picture tells you that the first three stands for three finger breadth between the incisors. Between these two upper and lower incisors, minimum three finger breadth should be there. So this tells you about adequate oral opening. And next three, this is higher to mental distance. This is the hyoid bone and this is the mentum. So hyoid to mental distance should be minimum of three finger breadth. So this tells you whether the chin is retracted. And next to two stands for thyroid to floor of mouth. This is the thyroid and this is the floor of mouth. So this tells you whether it's a short neck. So if at all the patient comes less than this three, three, two rule, then you can anticipate a difficult airway. What is Malampati score? So Malampati score tells you about the relationship of the tongue in the oral cavity. How big is the tongue in the oral cavity? So class one is proper opening. That is the facial pillars will be visible, soft palate will be visible and uvula can be seen. In class two, it is relatively less open. That is the facial pillars and soft palate are visible, but uvula usually is masked by the base of tongue. Class three is only the base of uvula is visualized neither the pillars nor the tonsils are visible. Class 4 is none of the three structures can be seen. So higher the grade of this Malampati score, the three or more is going to be a difficult airway. So coming back to the steps of rapid sequence intubation, you're going to set up a good IV line connecting to the monitors and planning the procedure along with the assessment of your airway. Then comes your preparation. You need to get all your equipments checked and ready. Make sure the suction is working, that it is connected to the wall mount and potentially you should have a rescue devices because this rapid sequence intubation uses not only a sedative but also a paralytic. You could end up in a situation like cannot intubate and cannot ventilate where you might lose your patient. So you should always have a plan B. 
So we can discuss about the plan B later. Next step is going to be pre-oxygenate and denitrogenate. In rapid sequence intubation, you may not get adequate time to pre-oxygenate a patient because sometimes the patient will be of full stomach and hemodynamically deteriorating. So at the best, whatever is possible, you try to pre-oxygenate the patient. So more adequate pre-oxygenation can purchase you more time in intubating. Consider pre-treatment agents based upon the underlying conditions. So what are these? These pre-treatment agents can decrease the sympathetic overactivity. Once you put your laryngoscope or the tube into the oral cavity, some persons can have a sympathetic overactivity by increased pulse rate, increased blood pressure. This increased pulse rate and increased blood pressure can be very detrimental if your patient is a coronary artery disease patient or aortic dissection patient or in a patient with head trauma where increased ICP is completely contraindicated. So if you suspect a patient to have this kind of issues like sympathetic overactivity, then you need to pre-treatment this patient. Some patients, especially the pediatric age group, if you put your laryngoscope or a tube, the patient can have a bradycardia. So you need to address it with your pre-treatment. Some patients can go for laryngospasm, severe bronchospasm and asthmatic attack during intubation. So these are the conditions where you should consider a pre-treatment. So these are the drugs usually we recommend that is lidocaine. Initially it was used topically over the posterior pharyngeal wall so that the gag reflux is minimized. So indications were in case of elevated ICP, bronchospasm, asthma, literally it is decreasing the sympathetic overactivity. But current evidences do not support the routine use of this lidocaine, so it is not used nowadays. The next is the fentanyl. With a minimal dose of 3 micrograms per kg IV, this can significantly decrease your sympathetic overactivity. So in cases of elevated ICP, cardiac ischemia, IoT dissection, you can give this fentanyl of 3 micrograms per kg IV so that the sympathetic overactivity is reduced. But beware, this can cause respiratory depression, hypotension and chest wall rigidity. So next, mostly in pediatric age groups where you see bradycardia, you could give atropine, that is 0 0.02 milligrams per kg IV. And the minimal doses of 0 0.10 is also recommended, but if only the patient has bradycardia. If there is no symptomatic bradycardia, there is no need to pre-treatment with atropine. 